Hey guys, today we're going to take a look at the four market structures and uh, market structures activity. Um, there's some notes that go along with this. Make sure you guys get those so that you guys can work on that and uh, be sure to be ready and, and to get things done. Um, but market structures is the big idea. First and foremost, I want to talk about a market. And it's one of many systems, institutions, procedures, social relationships, and infrastructures where parties engage in any type of exchange. Any type of exchange. Um, you know, it could be stocks, it could be commodities, it could be... Um, you know, going to the corner store to get a candy bar, right? All of those fall into that idea of an economic institution that allows us to make an exchange for something. Um, you know, when we look at things like the New York Stock Exchange, it's actually in the title, the exchange. Most times, our markets that we see here in the United States rely upon the use of money or currency to facilitate that exchange. Whereas other systems, and in the past, we've used things like bartering, um, you know, one of the famous misconceptions in United States history is that Manhattan Island was bought for some beads and twenty-four dollars, um, which is not true. But at the same time, it was is highlighting how Native Americans in our country like to barter for things. They didn't have currency, but they had things that substituted for currency, and that was a big deal. So when we talk about markets, we're talking about systems, institutions, our procedures. You know, we live in a society where you know, if we need something, we do something to get it. And that may be going to the store, maybe going there. So market is really important, and it's really important to understand the market structures. All right. In economics, a market structure is just basically how many firms are producing it and what do those firms do um, for that, you know. So when we look at and we walk through a grocery store aisle, maybe there's seven different kinds of flour. Maybe there's, you know, 300 different kinds of pop. You know, you see a lot of this, and and you kind of see that you know the flour is going to be flour and the pop is going to be pop. It's just going to have different flavors. And and when we take a look at market structures, that's really the idea that we're looking at is is how many firms are producing this product, and that's what's going to define our market structure. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, and and I want to walk through these with you guys and and talk about a couple of the examples and make sure that we're ready to kind of move forward with this. All right, so at this point, I really need you guys to take a look at your notes, and you guys will see a table there. And in that table, it, it kind of works through the ways that we're going to talk about. I'd like you guys to start filling that table in at this point. We're going to take a look at four different market structures. The first one is going to be our perfect competition. The second one, monopolistic competition. The third one, oligopoly, And the fourth one, monopoly. Perfect competition is our first one, and it's a theoretical market structure, meaning it, in theory it's there, but in practice it's probably not. But again, there would be many, many firms, thousands of firms, all right? No firm would have control over that market whatsoever, and all products are essentially the same. So when we talk about that, maybe we're talking something like threat. You know, it doesn't take much to get going into a thread or textile business. It doesn't take much to get involved in a, um, you know, maybe a financial market like a, a, a Bitcoin. And we kind of can see that a little bit. And when we talk, start talking about that, we're talking about, you know, how all of these different products are there. And they're pretty similar and how that affects the market. So one of the things that, that you'll see and that I really want to hit on is the price control and price control is what's going to be most important to us as consumers but price control is perfect competition is by far the best for us buyers right as a consumer i want perfect competition because that means that you know things are essentially pretty close to, to nothing because everything's the same and so many people are competing that the prices continue to drive down and it would be a very beneficial for thing for us as consumers. And one of the reasons for that is the idea of product standardization. And product standardization is that we have different firms producing nearly identical products, all right? Nearly identical, almost perfect substitute products, all right? And, and what you see is, is things like this. So a lot of times we see that these happening in agriculture. You're like, how is this corn different from this corn? How is this wheat different from this wheat? You know, Farmer Ted grows this corn, Farmer Bill grows this corn but they all kind of get blended together into something. And that's what kind of drives, you know, that, that commodity for corn. Another thing might be lumber in a sawmill because you can see the lumber 
as it's, it's, it's a standardized product and, you know, it's coming from similar trees, how different can it be? You know, and it's just something to think about. How different can it be? That's one of the big things there. And perfect competition has three main characteristics. There's many firms, no market advantage. The output is, is, is very standardized. And it's basically free entry in and out of the market as you please. Um, what I'm talking about there is I'm talking about barriers to get into the market. And in perfect competition that you and I could jump in and out of the market as we see fit without much investment, without much care. And we can make that happen. The next one I want to talk about is monopolistic competition. This is an imperfect competition model. Imperfect in comparison to pure competition. Um... But it's, there are many sellers, and they sell products that are slightly different with slight variations. Um, you know, a, a, a really great example is shoes. You know, what's the difference between a Converse and a Nike? You know, the purpose is the same. The idea is the same. A lot of the design may be similar, but it's kind of the outer shell of the shoe that makes the difference. And that's what we kind of see with that. When we talk about price control and monopolistic competition, we're talking about, you know, having a lot of substitute, near perfect substitute even, for these options because the price, because there are so many producers producing similar goods. You know, go back to the soda aisle. You know, you can see, well, what's the difference between a 7-Up, a Sierra Mist, a Sprite, and a Kmart brand, or a Kroger brand, or a Meyer brand, uh, lemon lime soda? There's not a lot of difference. So we see quite a bit of, of opportunity there. And we see quite a bit taking place there, but we have a lot of options, so our prices can be lower. I can't price my 12-pack of soda at you know $15 when a competitor is selling it for $3. So it's still very beneficial for us as a consumer to see you know monopolistic competition. And it's, a lot of it has to do with the idea of product differentiation. Product differentiation is there are slight differences so they're not perfect substitutes, but they're pretty similar. A great example of this would be the music industry or the book industry um, because there's so many musicians putting out music that you don't have to get the latest, greatest, biggest, most important thing. You don't have to go out and get the most famous album. There's a lot of albums that you can listen to. There's a lot of books that you can read that allow you the opportunity to, to make that happen in another way. So definitely one of those things to consider in that. The four things that differentiate a product is price. What is the price point of that product? How much does that product cost? Okay, the location. Where are you getting that product? All right, am I going to drive 50 miles to go get a product that I can get locally for 10 miles away? Probably not. The quality of the product. A lot of times it's a perceived quality because of a brand. But the quality of the product is a differentiation. You have a, a, a feeling that you know Nikes are, are going to be a better basketball playing shoe than you know a Perry Ellis you know, a, or, or something along those lines. All right. And the brand. The brand is one of the biggest things where the differentiation occurs because, again, you're going to notice three bars or, or a swoosh. And, and that means a different thing to you. Some characteristics of monopolistic competition include a large number of producers. Again, it's not an infinite number of producers, but there is a quite large number of producers. Think of books, CDs, again, many artists, many authors. Easy entry and exit into and out of the market. What's it take for me to record an album? Well, an instrument, some time, and some equipment. But then I can record an album. Or what's it take me to write a book? Well, paper, pen, computer. I can write a book, and it's done. It's not a difficult thing. It's time-consuming, yes, but it's not overall too difficult. Um, product differentiation has to exist. If we have 100 authors write the, the, the same book 100 times, that's not really different. They're not going to all be successful. right? If everything is standardized and the same, that's going to make it a pure competition. And again, nothing is ever that, that similar. And the use of non-price competition. Non-price competition is is kind of that branding aspect of it. Like, what is the difference between a Nike and a Skecher? Right? What's the difference between a Nike and, you know, a uh, Merrill rock climbing shoe or something? You know, what we can see is we see this. There's a there's a significant difference, but it's it's a non-price competition between those two. Like, if I want a basketball shoe, do I want a basketball shoe that is a Nike basketball shoe, or do I want a basketball shoe that is like. Um, 
you know, a K-Swiss basketball shoe. That's bringing back some, some past. You know, we don't see a lot of K-Swisses anymore. The last, or the third market structure is the oligopoly. An oligopoly is where there are only a few sellers in a market. And we're not talking like three. It could be as high as like seven, eight. But, you know, you see quite a bit of that. When it comes to price control, they tend to be a little bit higher if these, these groups of companies collude. But over time, it tends to be lower because it's not a monopoly. But it's, there's still some competition. It's, not, it's just not driving. When we talk about oligopies, we can talk about things like the steel industry, the automobile industry, um, the aircraft industry, uh, um, and some, some chemical industries, right? So how many major airlines do we have in the United States? You know, we don't have that many, and they control most of the flights. Most of the airports are dominated by these larger national airlines and, and less by the regional ones. So we see that. When we talk about that, you know, you can kind of see. What's it take for me to get into making cars for a living? You know, that's, that's a pretty big, pretty steep barrier for me to climb. All right, so we see that. So there's only a few car producers because of the amount that it takes to get involved in that. So characteristics of an oligopoly are few sellers, high barriers to entry, and independence between the firms. All right, if we don't see that independence, it gets a little kind of worrisome, and the United States government would get involved and try to, to, to create more independence. But again, we see that. Um, a great example of this would be the oil industry, and especially the OPEC, uh, the oil petro and petroleum exporting countries, um, that group is, is, is very centered and, and, and has complete control over the oil market for the most part, which allows them to control prices, allows them to stop other people from entering, and, and really means that there's only a few sellers of oil in our world. Um, and that's one of the things that drives our world. So we definitely can see that. So, you know, these products might be standardized. They might be different. It, it can kind of change. When you're buying steel, they're probably pretty close to standardized. But if you were to get something like breakfast cereals, probably quite different. And you can see in that picture that there's quite a few different types of breakfast cereals out there. You can go with a little healthy, you can go with Lucky Charms, you can go with, you know, quite a few different options there. So you can kind of see how that would, would affect it. The very last one that I want to talk about is the Monopoly. And, and many of us are familiar with the Monopoly board game. The, the purpose of the board game is to own as many properties as you possibly can to put your competitors out of business. And one way that you do that is by having a monopoly over the certain color. And when you can have that monopoly over the certain color, you can build houses and hotels that increase the rent when somebody lands there. So monopoly is, is basically, you know, there's one seller in the market. And this means high prices for consumers. Think about when you get four houses or a hotel on, on, on your property in monopoly, how much higher is the rent? It's incredibly high. Monopolies have complete control over their prices. No competition means they don't care if they raise the price because their customers are going to stay. Um, when we come back in, in the next part of it, we'll be looking at some historical monopolies. Um, and basically what we see with that is that we have to do quite a few different things to, to kind of to kind of to kind of look at those historical monopolies and control what 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 happens. The government is very involved in this, and I'd like you guys to think before we go today about the last thing that you guys would see with with having those monopolies in place. Characteristics of a monopoly are one firm, and there's very very strong uh, barriers to entry. There are no close substitutes, um, and monopolies tend to stifle innovation, stifle creativity, and you don't see a lot of new products. So they're actually usually pretty bad for us, whereas the other ones are there. So kind of in review, we've talked about four different types of market structure with the pure competition or perfect competition, monopolistic competition, the oligopoly, and monopoly, and, and how they're different. And, and we need to just take this away from and think about, well, how are these two things different? And you know, what's the best one for us to be a part of? What's the best one for a consumer to be a part of? If you were to run a business, what one would we want? And, and think about those types of things. So it's, it's one of those things that is uh, pretty important for us to, to kind of consider as we're going forward. So in closing, again, there's a short assignment that goes along with this video. Um, hopefully you guys complete that. And the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some historical monopolies in the history of the United States and their impact on our economy as a whole. 
So I want to thank you for watching, and I look forward to seeing you guys and talking with you soon. Have a wonderful day.